Keep your attention on the silence. Don't, don't let the mind go with the thought that's appearing in it at the moment. And don't let the mind relate to the sounds that are presenting themselves to the mind. Mind is an object known by awareness. Can you see awareness watching the mind? Or are you watching the mind? Does the mind know you? Or do you know the mind? Are you the mind or do you have a mind?
How is the mind known? The means of knowledge for the mind is awareness, myself. There is no second entity watching the mind. I watch the mind. Do I require the mind to be aware? Or does the mind require me to exist? If the mind needs me, then I'm free of the mind. If I need the mind, I'm not free of the mind. You can see from your own experience that you don't need a mind. Knowing this fact, I can now gain control of my mind. My awareness can gain control of my mind. Until I know that fact, I'm still awareness, but I'm awareness, I'm ignorant of the pow my power to stand apart from the mind, to non-identify with the mind. In verse 4, which we're going to discuss in a minute, Patanjali says that if you don't know this, that you're free of the mind, then you are going to identify with the mind. That's not called yoga. Yoga is non-identification with the mind. Based upon your own experience. as revealed by this teaching. So, <clears throat> we just finished talking about karma yoga, which was the first stage. He said there are five stages of Vedanta. And uh, the topic for this, set, this session now is uh, Upasana Yoga. Upasana Yoga is, is disciplining the mind. It's not, it's not gonna, uh, not gonna behave all by itself. Why, why, why can't the mind? Why won't the mind discipline itself? It doesn't know that it is undisciplined. <laughs> Why? Because the mind is an inert factor added to consciousness by Maya, by Ishwar, by ignorance. 
So how's the mind going to know that it needs to be disciplined? It's not. Because it's not a conscious entity. There's only one conscious entity. That's what non-duality means. It means there aren't two conscious entities, a mind and a self, or a lower self and a higher self, or a jiva and an ishwara, or however you want to, whatever words you'd like to use. There's not two. There's only one. If if there uh, if there's only one, the only way we can get two is what? By virtue of ignorance. <coughs> if, there, if there's something to be known, that means what? There's something that isn't known. The very fact that there is something to know means that there's something that's not, not known. So, when I'm practicing yoga, I'm the self-practicing yoga. <laughs> I know that what? These experiences uh, are not what, wanted by me as what? As a living being entity. I, if I'm free, I'm free to be a living entity, and I'm free to enjoy my life as a living, breathing, functioning entity. There's a notion in the spiritual world that 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 you that person dies and and the the yogi rises up to a different plane of consciousness and and functions from this plane of consciousness and not from this plane of consciousness at all. notion there's like a zombie like a zombie turn everything over to Ishwara and you function from this plane now that sounds very similar to what we say in Vedanta but it's not it's, it's similar but it's not the same I have to realize that I'm ignorant before I can what I can practice yoga. Now, you can't claim my identity as awareness. <laughs> if I claim that I'm only awareness, what's going to happen? My mind is just going to continue to function as before, and I'm going to have plenty of unwanted experiences and thoughts. Why would I want that? If I was the self or anything else, <laughs> no matter what I am, I do not want unwanted experiences. Now you can say, well, all experiences are, are acceptable to me as the self. Well, fine. Then enjoy all unwanted experiences. But as an individual, you won't enjoy all unwanted experiences. Whereas if you understand the difference between the mind and the self, huh, you can remove these unwanted experiences. And bless your jiva, huh? Bless your jiva with happiness and remove one uncomfortable person, one, uncomfort, one uncomfortable entity from the total, which means what? You can bless the world with your presence. Otherwise, you're blessing the world with your presence and your absence. Your absence from what? From happiness. You're blessing the world with what? With your with your troubles. With your suffering. Whatever it is. Are you, are you free if you what? If you cannot bless the world with your happiness, with your presence? So... So, yoga is, we said, what? Gaining mastery of the mind. <coughs> and the self will be doing this. 
It's always the self. If anything's being done, it's being done by the self. I know the self is not a doer, but the self is capable of doing, assuming the presence of Maya. <coughs> if the self were incapable of action, then it wouldn't be free, would it? So, so what is Upasana Yoga? That's called Ashtanga Yoga. These Ashtanga Yoga is, are the disciplines that are laid out by Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras that, that are the discipline, disciplines, there are eight of them, but they all boil down to one discipline because you can practice all eight at the same time, well, serially, but at the same time. You don't have to spend 10 years doing yamas and five years doing niyamas and two years doing pratyahara and so forth and so on, dhar dharana and dhyana and samadhi and all these different practices. You have to work at each one and master that particular one. You master them all at once. Understanding how to withdraw the mind. Did you notice how we would we withdrew from the mind in that meditation? How long did that take? <laughs> it didn't take long at all, did it? To observe the mind. If you're observing the mind, you're not the mind, are you? That's the fundamental law. This is the fundamental basic law. If you can see it, you cannot be it. If you say, I'm not enlightened, I'm ignorant, I'm suffering, you're not suffering, are you? Are you suffering? If you can, if they make that statement? <laughs> you're the knower of the suffering. The knower never suffers. The knower is always apart from what it experiences or enjoys. Suffering in this sense means enjoying and suffering. Experiencing means enjoying and suffering. Think about that. How wonderful is that? How absolutely wonderful that I never become what I what I see, what I know. I'm always apart, stand apart from it. He says here in the in the fourth the fourth verse. This is in, on page three. He says, "When the waves in the chitta, the chitta means the mind stuff." That means your vasanas, your thoughts, and your feelings. Those are chitta. That's called chitta, vrittis. These are the thoughts in the mind stuff. This is the mind stuff. The mind stuff is matter. It's made of the three gunas. We get to that. And so forth and so on. And in that mind stuff, there are these swirls, these whirlpools of energy playing in the mind. It says, when the waves in the chitta are unrestrained and they're not controlled, then what happens? There is identification with the thoughts. If they're uh, if if they're restrained, then what? There's no you see that there's no there's no need for identification. If you understand that you are the one that knows the mind, then they become automatically restrained. Because it's only identifying with the vrittis that keeps the vrittis spinning, keeps the vrittis moving, the thoughts and feelings moving. What is it that would cause these vrittis, these thoughts and feelings, to keep bothering you, to keep coming back and disturbing you? Money, sex, power, Fame, etc., 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 all the things that that we become obsessed with. What what is it? 
It's simply our vasanas, our tendencies, the karma that we come in with. These are the issues that are, that are important to us. And because of that, we identify, and, and, and what happens? This chakra goes round and round and round and round. And if I don't see that I'm naturally non-identified as awareness, in other words, that's called sahaja samadhi, it's a natural samadhi. The natural samadhi is what? Is awareness. Existence shining as awareness. If I don't see that, then what? Then I need to what? Disidentify. Now that's difficult to do, isn't it? Because I have a habit of what? A bad habit of identifying with all these things. When a particular issue comes up, I immediately jump on that issue and I start thinking about it. I start feeding it with what? Thoughts. I start adding, adding more thoughts to that issue, whatever it is. And it starts to grow and grow and grow. And I, it can grow to such a degree that I become obsessed with whatever it is. Worried about money, worried about pleasure, worried about recognition. It's a big one nowadays. The, the, the world, in, 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 particularly in America and Western civilizations now, people are totally worried about being recognized. They feel like nobody's paying attention to them. They need to be recognized. Why? Because they're not paying attention to themselves. If you pay attention to yourself, you don't need anybody else to pay attention to you. If you don't know how to pay attention to yourself, you don't even know that you have a self that doesn't need attention, then what do you do? You demand attention, you demand respect, you demand love you demand from other people. When no one can give you that, only I can give that to myself. By understanding this fact, that I am what's worthy of attention, worthy of love. Because it's for the sake of what? It's for the sake of myself that I do everything, isn't it? I know, I know. We like to think that it's for the sake of my wife or my kids or, or my country, you know, Russia or Ukraine or America, or, or it's, it's for the sake of something other than me that I do all this thing. That's to make us feel virtuous, to signal our virtue, but it's not, that's not true. I wouldn't do that if it didn't please me to do that, would I? Which proves that what? The love of the self is the primary love. All other loves are for what? For my sake. If I want solitude, if I want companionship, if I want whatever it is. If I want enlightenment, I only want it for myself. Because why? Because I love myself more than anything. There's no other option because there isn't any other self to love. When you look at what is my, what is my family, but a, but a, the concept of a family. You, do you have a do you have a mother or a father or a brother or a sister or a daughter or a son when you're not thinking about them? Do you? You, you think you do. <laughs> you think they exist, but they only exist when you, the thought of them appears in your mind. You know, isn't that weird? Isn't that strange? Huh? Because I believe that they're actually there all the time when they're not there at all. They're only there when the thought appears. Which means what? They're completely dependent upon me.
when you know that, that you're free, then what? Every, every object that appears in your environment, in your awareness, is blessed by you. Without you doing anything, your very presence blesses those, those entities that appear, those conscious entities that appear. Why? Because it awakens the awareness in them. The awareness in those objects, those people, suddenly becomes aware of itself in the presence of awareness without you doing one damn thing to take care of them. That's how you love and take care and serve the world, is by what? By presenting yourself as awareness to the world. You can't present yourself as awareness to the world and present a disturbed mind to the world. It's not, not going to work, is it? Because the disturbed mind will set that, that uh, minds that are available in your environment in, into a state of, of dullness or agitation. Well, it, if the mind, the vrittis are, as he says, if the vrittis are restrained, then what happens? Then they cannot express in what, then what, what's present while the vrittis are Neutralized. I'm a, I'm present. It's always only the self that you love. Only. There's no there's no other option. We have to say this because, you know, all of these problems are because of attachments to. What situations, people, things, so forth and so on, experiences, and so forth and so on. People say, oh, I like being attached. Well, okay, you can like it or you think you can like it, but you don't really like it. You just say that because huh? you don't know there's an option, and you don't know that what? Freedom is the greatest blessing. for the world. So he says here, <clears throat> Ashtanga Yoga, so what is Ashtanga Yoga? Well, it's, it's living a what? An alert, intelligent, religious life, conscious life, not running off of habits. It says here, Ashtanga Yoga is leading an alert, attentive life and resting control of the mind from unconscious forces. This is, your, this is your unconscious. These are the unconscious forces up here, this little band. All this stuff is happening all at once. It's not, it's not serial. We, we have to, to slow it down for teaching, we have to present it in a cause and effect model to get, break it up to make it you to understand it. But all this is happening all at once. The self is present. The mind, the unconscious mind, is very powerful. As Vishwara, that's operating all the time. Your thoughts are operating. Your feelings are operating simultaneously. They're all going on. This calling a thought a, th a thought, calling a thought a thought is calling a feeling a thought, or calling a feeling a thought is calling huh, a thought a feeling. They're both the same. They're just different words for the same thing. And at the same time, what's happening? The senses are operating. The body, uh, the active organs are active. The passive organs are taking in information. And the world outside is uh, in a state of constant flux. The elements are continually what? Changing. So... So it says here, it says here, it's possible for people who are aware, who are aware that they are, it is, in other words, the strong guild is for people who are aware that what? That they're their own worst enemy. 
<laughs> in other words, what? That they're sabotaging themselves. That, that if you're blaming the world, if you're saying, you know, this, that, or the other thing, whether it's mom or pop or the federal government or, or whatever it is, or the economy or whatever it is, that's why I'm suffering, then you're not ready for Stanga Yoga because you don't want to take responsibility for your own mind. You want to blame, you want to blame somebody else. That seemingly absolves you of the responsibility uh, to do anything about it, to do the Ashtanga Yoga, to the practice yoga. Yoga is a, you know, is a, is a commitment, a discipline. And based upon this understanding, it says here, uh, so th th uh, th this, if you're sabotaging yourself, you can't blame anybody else. <laughs> right? So it says, since hard and fast knowledge is the only means for liberation, or liberation, it is liberation, freedom, uh, at, insofar as the self is only what? Apparently not actually ignorant. If the, if the self is actually ignorant, then what, can we do anything about it? Huh? You, know, <laughs> you can't change what is. You can't change what's actual. You can only change what's apparent or you can only remove ignorance. And so it says here, um, it is con what a sense liberation in uh, liberation insofar as the self is only apparently not actually ignorant. It's considered to be superior to yoga, owing to the fact that uh, action can't remove ignorance. If I think I'm a born entity, if I think I was born. When you when uh, when we did that little meditation, what did you answer when you said, uh, "Am I the body or do I have a body?" What what was your answer? I have a body. Huh? Did anybody answer, "I am the body"? But I'll bet you that from time to time you actually do think you are the body, because like if I huh. If I say you got a big ugly nose, <laughs> uh, what, what are you going to do? You going to love me for saying that? You going to see that as an act of love? I, huh? No, you're not. Because you're going to think you're the body, huh? But the self doesn't have a nose. Huh? Self has no nose. So. Uh, that those all those insults don't apply to the self at all. Yeah. So he said here. Uh, so the whole problem is what I can't identify with the thoughts, but I do. It's impossible for me to identify with the thoughts, but I do. See see the paradoxes that that abound here that I have to have to deal with. Uh, and I have to, you know, I, I need to uh, be honest and say, I am identified here, and then what? And then, if I pay attention to the silence, in other words, if I take the silence into account, the awareness, silence just means awareness, if I take awareness or existence into account, what happens to the identification? It's, it's broken. So, so there's an instant, immediate, what, freedom that's gained by, what, identifying as awareness. Now, there's always, that's always a possibility, isn't it? Because awareness is always present. When is awareness not present? Thoughts are sometimes present and sometimes absent. But I've got something that's always present that, what, I can identify with. Which, which is what? Gives me access to myself, assuming I don't know that I am awareness to start with. 
In other words, when I find myself emotionally disturbed, what should I do? Immediately, uh, ask who is emotionally disturbed. And your mind will go right to the one that's not disturbed. And you will become the one that's not disturbed. Become in quotation marks. Because you already were that. But it will feel like you've become free. You have become free because you were free all along. But the ignorance made it seem as if you weren't free. The lack of freedom is purely notional. It's not actual. It's purely an idea that I'm not free. It's a notion, a concept that I'm not free. The real key is this, it's easy to slip over this and just forget this, but I am never what I see. This is why at the very beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, and he just glosses over it, because he actually knows that Arjuna is not going to get it, but he needs to explain the whole thing anyway. He says, the self cannot be objectified. This, this I can never, ever become an object. So if there are objects, then every object has got to be the self, that's all. There's no other option. Because the statement that Vedanta starts with is everything is what? Consciousness. Everything is existence, shining as what? Ever full, unborn, whole and complete, actionless, ever-present awareness. Everything that is. So there's no other option. If, if you accept this premise, this is where, we, this is where all, all, the, all the teachings start, and this is where all the teachings return to, to this one statement. Why would they return to it? Well, because I journeyed away from that. In other words, I didn't understand what I, that everything I'm experiencing, what? Is me, in the sense that it depends upon me, but I am what? Free of everything that is. That is, I cannot be objectified. It's such a tricky little subtle paradox. It's so hard to accept. But the key is to remember that. Nothing, huh? I cannot be turned into an object. Awareness is never becomes an object. So if there are objects, then the objects have to be awareness, because I know I'm aware, don't I? Does, it, does anybody think they're not aware? Please raise your hand. Oh, no hands go up. Hmm. Okay, does anybody not exist? No, there's nobody here that doesn't exist? Oh, hmm. That's very interesting. Those are these are facts. These these are facts. That's facts means what is. Now, uh a, a fact is something you can't do anything about. You either understand it. The light is shining. Is that, is, huh? That's a fact. There's nothing to be done about that. Either I understand that or not. This is a paper clip. <laughs> what, what can I do about that? I can't. There's nothing to be done. It is a fact that I exist and that I'm aware. The only problem is what? It's not clear that what? My awareness is what? Bliss and what? And limitless. In other words, I think my awareness is limited, don't I? I think it's not free. And, and why do I think that? It's more, the whys are all, this is all about the why. 
Why do I think that the, the, that the, I know that I'm aware and I know that I exist, but I don't know that I'm free? Limitless. Limitless means what? That I, I'm not modified or limited by what happens. That's what, what it means. Why? Because when you say the word I, and see if this isn't true for you, when you say the word I, just normally, don't you include your body and mind with the word I? Huh? Yeah. See the problem? There's your ignorance right there. Huh? Because huh, the body and the mind don't belong with this. With me. Those, the body and mind are added by ignorance to this. Does, does awareness have, have a nose? Does it have toes? Does it have ears and eyes? Huh? It seems to, when we think of Ishwar, and it becomes a universal person, seemed to me, and I was the same eye looking out through all the different bodies and minds. It looks like all the bodies and all the minds belong to the eye, but they don't, do they? No bodies and minds belong to the eye. The eye is what? Independent completely of what? Any form. The, the, all these instruments that we have are what? They evolved over, over countless billions of millennia. Long, that whole process was set in, in, in was started, how, who, nobody knows when it began. We, in fact, we, we can't even, our, our, our time span, relative time span is like 60, 70, 80 years. We're not even capable of imagining Ishwara's time span, how long it took for Ishwara to generate all of this matter and all these processes. Before there were any conscious beings, there had to be plenty of matter, didn't there? Huh? Did, didn't Ishwara have to lay out the whole material universe before the conscious beings appeared here? No? Well, if, if if there's no material, if, if there's no material universe here, then how are the conscious beings going to act out their karma? Because that's what we're doing here, isn't it? As as conscious entities, we're acting out our karma. But if there's no material world, how can they, the 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 jivas, the entities, the created entities, how can they act out their karma? They can't. Ishwara's got to lay down the field. Here, all your vasanas are all built in uh, from the beginning. Uh, that's all built in. And, and now Ishwara sends me to the earth, but there's no earth. <laughs> there's no air, fire, water, earth, and space. There's no way, way for me to work out my karma. So I'm just fr totally frustrated. Here I am. I've got all these desires all these fears, and there's no place to work them out. How's that going to happen? I know, you don't think about this because, because that knowledge is only available through inference. And, and for Vedanta to work, you need to trust inference as a valid means of knowledge. Inference won't tell you exactly what it is, but it'll tell you how it's possible and how it could happen. So, so I, you know, so Ishwara, what does it do? Ishwara generates the whole material world first. And, and that process, that's the Panchikarana teaching, you know, the Panchikarana teaching, that's what, how, how, uh, 
the, the, the concept of the elements appears first in Ishwar's mind, and then what? And then the, those five ideas, the air, fire, water, earth, and space are just ideas in Ishwar's mind. How those divide and, and recombine with the portions of each, of, of each one of them. You know, there's a, a mathematical formula. It has to be a mathematical formula because everything is formulaic here. To produce what? The earth. Now, I've got the earth and everything's functioning here, but now, now it's possible for what? For consciousness to what? Appear here as a living entity because there's some place for me to work out my karma. Think about this. This is mind-boggling. This my this ignorance. This is this is totally cool. Huh? This is totally interesting. This is fascinating, in fact. That's why I call it beautiful intelligent ignorance. Huh? How intelligent ignorance is. I mean, how, how do you, how have you managed to survive for, what, is there any 20-year-olds here? No, I don't think so. For 34, that's probably 30, maybe somebody in 30s here. But say 40, 50, 60 years. I've, I've managed to survive by 80, for 81 years. How have I done that? <laughs> 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 Who knows, huh? Think about it. Something has given me that special knowledge to allow me to uh, to function for that length of time and to what? To work out my stuff here. Whatever, whatever it is. Anyway, I got a couple more minutes. Any any uh, questions so far? <coughs> this nope. might be a chicken and egg question, but um, you know, in, in order to generate karma and to create vasanas, it, we'd have to be interacting with the with the um, Maya, right? That's right, with the world. But, yeah. uh, yeah, well, it's the answer is it's beginningless, right? <laughs> it's, the answer is it's... it's I think I, I forgot. <laughs> the, 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 that's the answer is it's beginningless. Do, do you have, a, do you have a, a chicken? A chicken without an egg? Do you have an egg without a chicken? Huh? So, which came first? The chicken or the egg? Chicken. Huh? Together. Pardon? Both together. Both came first. Well, two things can't come first. Both came together. <laughs> they, are. They, they came at the, they were the same thing. That's what you mean. They're non-different. The chicken and the egg are non-different. They're mutually dependent concepts. I need an egg to get a chicken, and I need a chicken to get an egg. Does that mean what? Does that mean the egg and the chicken are free? No. Because the egg depends upon a chicken, and a chicken depends upon an egg. So if I think I'm doing something here, and that I have vasanas here, huh, I'm caught in this cycle of going round and round and round from chicken to egg, and I think there's a first. I think something's happening. But the fact that these things are, are what? Produced by ignorance means that nothing's actually happening here. If nothing's actually happening here, then what? Then what do I have to do? <laughs> what can I do? I'm not doing anything when I'm doing something. Yeah. 
So in the Bhagavad Gita it says the one the one who sees action in action and inaction in action, that's a wise person. In other words, see that there's no difference between what? Between the subject and the, the between the cause and the effect. The chicken is the, the egg is the cause and the chicken's the effect. But what? The chicken's the cause and the egg's the effect. Isn't it? If I just reason from either point of view, I come to the same place, which means there's no first. So this whole idea of being in time, this whole idea of karma, karma yoga is all based upon the idea that, that these vasanas are real and that I'm the doer's real and that I need to get rid of these things and so forth and so on. That just wipes out karma yoga altogether, doesn't it? The chicken and the egg, huh? That's, that's knowledge. Can you argue with that? Huh? Can, you can't argue with it. I mean, I'm a smart guy, but I can't argue with it. I'm, I'm, I'm always the genius guy. I can't argue with it. My I don't need, you know, nobody can argue with it. Because it's just a fact. That I don't take it as a fact, well, that's, that means I've got some more Vedanta to do. I've got some more listening to do. I have some more yoga to do, some more work and purification on my mind till, uh, till that clicks. It will click. It, at some point, it just goes click. Oh, all right, I got it. So it's beautiful how that works. I should read you this lovely email I got from a young Muslim man in, in uh, Africa. Uh, maybe I will read it to, uh, one day soon. He just came in yesterday and it was so inspiring because you could see, you could see this thing working and, and his ignorance being exposed to him and his gaining the knowledge as, as it goes and how that ignorance covers up what he knows and how that knowledge reveals what he doesn't know. It's a really beautiful uh, thing. A handsome, really smart young guy. Okay, anyway. So that, that's verse 4, but there are a few before it. So it says, now the instructions on yoga. That's the first verse of Patanjali Yoga. Now uh, the instructions on yoga. Now what does the now mean? Assuming the certain qualifications. So, so yoga means I need to have, I say have certain kind of qualifications. Assuming you have these qualifications, you can practice yoga. Vedanta also says, so you need these various qualifications to practice Vedanta. And what, and then it describes what, what yoga is. It's mastery of the thought modifications in the mind. We talked about that. Explain that. And then what? And a controlled mind leads to what? Rest or repose in one's true nature. Jnana nishta, it's called. Why is it, repose is called jnana, nishta. Nishta means what? Situated. And jnana means what? Situated in knowledge. Knowledge is what? Situated in knowledge. So Patanjali is talking about knowledge here. Jnana, nishta. Those are the words he uses. Then, verse 4, he says, When the waves in the chitta are unrestrained, see, this is the down, this is the, this is the problem. Here's, here's the solution right here. Restrain the chitta. And if you don't want to restrain the chitta, then what do you do? Then you identify with your thoughts. See the logic? Now, I have to, the qualification is I have to, like, uh, Trust inference, trust the logic here, which is creating this knowledge that's going to motivate me to what? To control my mind. Uh, uh, the, the average person doesn't trust inference, even though they use, people use inference every single minute of the day. Huh? Inference is used constantly throughout the day. People don't recognize it as what? 
for what it is and the value of inference. So, as I said, then, I've got another couple of minutes. Five. Then, you know, if I identify, he says, he's going to tell us now, get specific here about what has to happen, what we need to do. Thoughts which are painful, rajasic, quote unquote, and not painful, sattvic, are categorized into five types. And he's going to now explain those five types of thoughts. Remember, we're working on the vrittis in the mind, and the vrittis are of five types, five types of thoughts, and he's going to explain those thoughts for us now, <coughs> next, which we will take up after the break. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> uh, what's that? A cliffhanger. A cliffhanger. Yeah, well. Huh? 